Well, man, if you, uh, it's great to see you this morning. If uh, you have a Bible with you, and I hope you do, turn to John chapter four. If you don't have one and you'd like, there's always some in the back. And, and uh, whatever you do as we go through the service, you can just utter a little prayer that my voice will hold out. And, and so I'm sipping on tea and everything else this morning, but God is good and he'll get us through this morning, I'm sure. So um, uh, last week we, we began a series um, called This Is Us. And I know some of you um, uh, have watched the TV show. I hear it's all about relationships and certainly this is about our relationship with God. But This Is Us is, is really a, a series through the month of January. We're kind of looking under the hood of Newberry Park First Christian Church. We're kind of looking at and saying, okay, what makes us, us? Um, what is it that we are called to do and be um, as a church family? And I know many of you may be new with us, but we're taking this time to just dive in and to take a look at what our mission, our values, our purpose is here, and, and then how we live that out. What are the strategies by which we, we try to accomplish the mission and vision that God, we believe, has given us? And, and last week, we zeroed in on the mission. Um, we talked about um, what our mission was, and, and it's on your, your notes in, in your bulletin if you have those. Um, it's up on the, it'll be up on the screen here. Um, and, and the mission, the vision, um, what we are called to do here at New Bay Park First Christian Church, and would you read this with me? It's to develop fully devoted followers of Christ who seek and save the lost. And we unpack that. If you want to dive into that more and weren't here, you can uh, jump back and see the... Um, the, the video or the podcast, um, and we talked about the reality that, that we are here to continue to grow in our relationship with God and to seek and save those who are still in need of that, and, and that we're not called to just focus on what's here, but everything that's out there that God wants us um, to do. And so today we're going to begin to unpack three strategy statements that we use here to really be the core of everything that we do. And, um, and, and it's the way that we help people become more fully devoted followers of Christ. And the three things, and you can jot these down um, in your notes, um, are to encounter God, to build community, and to extend compassion. Uh, th those are the things that we focus on. Now, um, you, you, you could come up with your own words, but these are the ones that we use to try to like, keep us focused. Because if we don't have something to focus on, um, you know, the, the old King James book in, in, in Proverbs, it says, um, where there's no vision, the, the people um, run amok, basically, is, is what it means. And it, we, we just get scattered. And I don't know about you, but unless I'm very focused, I, I tend to go all over the place. And as a church, we, wanna, we just want to hone in on what our mission is. And so this morning, we're, we're going to focus in on what it means to encounter, encounter God. Um, and, and, and that's huge. And for some of you, you, you may you, you may think, well, you know what that is, and hopefully today we can take some new things away, but as we begin, I want to invite you to pray what I think is an incredibly simple but very dangerous prayer, and it's simply this little prayer, and it says, it's, dear Lord, I want to encounter you today, and so I just want to take a moment and, and let you take a minute and just and, and pray that prayer. Um, Utter that prayer and just say, if that is your heart's desire, then, then pray that, um, dear Lord, I want to encounter you today, all right? So take a moment and just, just think through that, pray through that. Lord, dear Lord, I want to encounter you today. Now, to help us understand what encountering God is all about, I want to take a look at someone who encountered God uh, in the book of John. Uh, Devin had shared uh, about the gal who, who uh, uh, broke the, the bottle of perfume, poured on Jesus' feet. And we're going to look at a very familiar story out of John chapter 4. You know, the, noon, the noonday sun beat down as this woman approached the well. She'd come to the well every day at this time for who knows how long. And she would have come earlier, but there would have been crowds, and, and in the crowds there would have been judgmental glances. So rather than having everyone avoid her, she avoided everybody else. But today would be different. Today, today she, would, she would not be alone at the well. Today, 
Today she would meet the one who would quench her thirsty soul. And today she would meet Jesus. Today she would encounter God and her life would never be the same. And that is my greatest desire for each of us today. For every single one of us that not only would we come and we would hear something, maybe something new, maybe something about God, that we would get more information, that we would walk away with more things to do. That, but my prayer is that, that today and every day that you would encounter God. As, as we were looking at the strategy, the word encounter was, was chosen specifically, and it was, it was chosen for a reason. Because encounter, encounter means to engage. It, it means to experience. It means to come face to face. And when you come face to face with God, it'll change you. Everyone in scripture who came face to face with God was radically changed. Now, I love this time of year. Um, I, I love, um, I, I like sports. And so, you know, during the, the football uh, season, uh, we come to the playoffs. And, you know, of course, since my, my Rams are doing better this year, um, uh, I'm more excited. Uh, but, but the reality is, is there's a lot of preparation that, that goes into all of these games. These guys prepare like crazy. They study the film. They memorize plays. They practice. And they practice not until they get it right, but until they can't get it wrong, right? And they just, they just go, and they 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 go. And they're practicing and practicing. But the reality is, is they do not play the game. They do not encounter the other team until they get on the field. Until they're face to face. Until they're, you know, across the line from some big, huge guy that wants to just tear their head off, Right? And then there's an encounter. And then that encounter, there's some push and there's some pull and there's some, but, but it's not until we come face to face that we truly encounter. And we want you to not just, you know, study a lot about God. Now that's great. We don't want you to just, you know, think about. We don't want you to just learn or to have knowledge. We want you to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the God of the universe who loves you. So now back to the story. In, in John chapter four, we'll give a little context here. In John chapter four, starting in verse one, it says, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. That was John the Baptist. And although in fact, he was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son J Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. So this is kind of the context. This is the scene. And in John chapter 2, Jesus had gone to Bethlehem, or, I'm sorry, not Bethlehem, J Jerusalem, to celebrate the Passover yeah, that huge feast that the, the Jewish men were supposed to go to every year, they, and he went to the Passover in Jerusalem. Now, um, then after that, in, in chapter three, he stayed, and he was in the Judean countryside preaching and teaching, baptizing, probably near the Jordan River, that's where John would baptize. Now, um, it, just a little bit of a, a um, geography lesson, there, it, there's, um, Judah is down in the southern kind of part, um, Jerusalem, you can see, is the top of what's called the Dead Sea there. And then Galilee is up, t up atop by, by the Sea of Galilee, which makes sense. But Jesus had to travel from Jerusalem to Galilee, right? Now, obviously, as it said in the scripture, he had to go through Samaria. Now, the one thing that we need to understand about this is, is that Judah and Gal um, between Judah and Galilee is a Samaria place. And 750 years earlier, the Assyrians... Okay, who live over in modern day like Syria, okay? they, they came in and they took captive the, the northern tribes of Israel and they took them away. And when they took them away, a few people left behind and then the Assyrians sent some of their people to start inhabiting the land and they started to intermarry with the children of Israel that were left behind. And so these people became kind of half-breeds. They weren't fully Jewish, they weren't fully Syrian. They were, they were these kind of half-breed people and everyone hated them, especially the Jews. 
uh, every time the Jews would look at him, they would be reminded that, you know, of, of the terrible captivity that, that the people were under. And so these, the, these people were just despised because they were half-breeds. And not only were they half-breeds, but the people that stayed behind, they said that like, they were the true Israelites, and so they actually had their own um, version of the Torah, and they had their own place of worship. They had their own temple at Mount Gerizim, um, instead of Jerusalem, because certainly the Jews weren't going to let them come and worship in Jerusalem anyways. And so Jesus comes to this place, and he's tired and he's thirsty, having walked all that way, and he sits down by the well, and this is the place where he encounters, where the Samaritan woman encounters Jesus. And so in, in John chapter 4, verse 7, then, it says this, it says, um, that when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, like, like we just discussed. Now, in the story, we're going to discover several things that happen, and I think happen for a lot of us when we encounter God, when we have an encounter with Jesus and who he really is. The first is this, is that we should expect the unexpected, okay? Expect the unexpected. Now, notice that this, this woman is surprised. She's surprised that, that Jesus would even address her, have anything to do with her. Uh, the Jews believed that to, to even go through this place um, uh, would make them unclean, and to, for Jesus to talk to this woman, to, to touch anything that she had touched, it would make Jesus unclean, and so she's totally surprised. Um, one of the things I, I didn't show you in the map is, is um, oftentimes people would, uh, the, the Jews, instead of going through Samaria, they would actually skirt all the way around so that they wouldn't have to like even put their feet on the ground in Samaria. But Jesus walks through this place and he sits down this well. This woman is totally in shock that Jesus is even going to talk to her. Now, first of all, most of the rest of the people in town have been avoiding her. And she's been avoiding them. And we're going to find out in a little bit. She's got a few character issues that kind of cause some tension there. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't. And she is just shocked that this Jewish man would, would who she expects to look down on her, that he engages with her. Now I know a lot of people, a lot of people who keep their distance from God because they think that God or his followers, let's get honest, look down on them in judgment. I know a lot of people who wanna keep their distance from God because they feel like they don't measure up, that they feel like they'll be exposed, but this story reminds us that Jesus came to seek and save the lost that he came to seek and save the, the marginalized, that he came to save sinners. Any sinners in the house this morning? Yeah, that he came to save people like us. And, and, and so God so loved the world. The only prerequisite for receiving God's love is you gotta be a citizen of the world. And, and, and so Jesus comes to this place and he's, he, he engages this woman See, and, and God's desire to have, is to have a restored relationship with people. And our job is simply to introduce people to Jesus. So Jesus shatters her expectations by interacting with her. And Jesus wants you, he wants us to know that he desires to interact with you too. That he just doesn't want you to just know some things about him. He wants you to interact with him. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but I usually approach Jesus with some expectations. Um, I usually have a plan, um, and I expect that if, uh, that, that, that if I follow this plan, things are going to work out good. But Jesus' plan is always different than mine. Jesus' plan is always better than mine. I have expectations about how God should answer my prayers. I have expectations about how quickly he should answer my prayers. But for some reason, Jesus keeps reminding me that I need to learn patience. And I need to just trust him. Now, I, I have all kinds of other expectations of Jesus. I, I expect Jesus to, to fix things, to, to heal things, to heal people. But instead, he tells me, 
that he has a plan and I'm supposed to trust him. Sometimes I, I expect Jesus to bless my agenda, but Jesus reminds me to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and, and then maybe we'll get to Ken's agenda later. When I sin, to be quite honest, when I sin, I expect Jesus to scold me. But oftentimes the, the great thing is, is that he shatters that expectation and reminds me that he loves me and that he forgives me, that he went to the cross so that that sin doesn't have to stay in between us anymore. And I'm discovering that I have expectations because I think I'm in charge. And Jesus keeps subtly reminding me that he is. And if we'll engage with him, he will shatter our expectations, but he'll give us himself. We had a short uh, staff retreat this last week, which is probably where I left my voice. And the speaker pointed out that most of us approach God in a very, very mechanical um, way that oftentimes we have a transitional relationship, transactional, I'm sorry, transactional relationship with God. That we have our checklist of things that we're supposed to do, that we think that we need to do to stay in God's favor. And when we do our part, when we check the boxes, you know, uh, read my Bible today, check. You know, went to church, check. Put some money in the offering, check. You know, all those, all those different things that, you know, that we, we, that we think if, if we check off the boxes, then we expect God to do his part, right? That, that's, that's how a lot of us approach him. You know, if, if I do all this, then God's gonna do this, and you know, maybe he's gonna listen to my prayers a little bit more, and maybe I'm gonna get my way a little bit more, and we and it's this trans, transactional thing, like if I do this, he'll do this. And, and every time Jesus shatters those expectations, <laughs> and, and he says, you know, he, he says, listen, instead of doing things for him, we need to do things with him. And that's, that's huge, folks, is instead of just, now, if you're doing things with him, you're certainly gonna be doing things for him and for the sake of his kingdom. But folks, we, we think that if we just do all these things for him, if we, if, if we just do, do the right things, that somehow our expectations will be met. But the reality is, is that he just wants us to do life with him. And when it comes to encountering God, we need to expect the unexpected. But most of us recognize that, but most of all, I think God wants us to recognize that he wants to encounter us. Not just here, but everywhere. Not just on Sundays, but every day, every moment. But we tend to, we tend to like to leave God at those checkbox places. You know, we like to leave him in the Bible because we can close it up and set it over here, get on with our agenda. We like to leave God here at church, and then we can go to work and do whatever we want, or school and neighborhoods. We, we like to leave God in those places, but God wants to be with us everywhere and wants to do life with us. And so when we encounter God, he shatters our expectations. The other thing is that when we encounter God, it points us to what is most important, okay, what's most important. Jesus is in John uh, chapter four, starting verse 10, he says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and as did um, also his sons and his livestock. And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now notice this, this woman is focused on the literal water. She, she's focused on what she can do and, and what she thinks is gonna quench her thirst, what she needs. And she never has heard about this living water before. She doesn't even know 
that's, there's something like this that even exists or, or something that she can have. But Jesus reveals this to her. And what I love about it is as soon as she hears about it, she's all in. As soon as she hears about this, she's like, hey, it, you know what? Give me this living water. Jesus shows us that the things that we try to fill our life with will never fully satisfy. They will never fully quench our thirst. He shows us that all the things that we're chasing are not going to satisfy the desires of our hearts. And he offers us what's most important. He offers us relationship with him. He offers us eternal life. He offers us himself. And and Jesus doesn't share our timing because he has this eternal perspective. He always sees sees things in a different way. And Jesus is more concerned with, with eternal things than he is about the temporal things. He's more concerned about this woman, you know, and her relationship with God than the, the temporal water that she's after. And, and he's more concerned in our life, he's more concerned with our character than our comfort. You know, we, we constantly pray for our comfort and the things that, you know, the desires of our hearts. And he's more concerned about things like our character, our soul, like where, where we are in relationship with him. And because of that, when we encounter him, it causes us to deal with our sin. It reveals our sin in, 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 in our lives. And, 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 and that's, that sounds really scary, but, but it's out of his love that he, he reveals this to us. In, in verse 16, he says, he told her, go call your husband and come back. And then she says, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, okay, in fact, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Then she responds, sir, the woman said, I see that you're a prophet, right? All of a sudden she sees that he can read deep down inside. See, Jesus knows her issues. Shoot, everybody else in town does too. But Jesus doesn't bring this up to rub it in her face. Rather, he asks her a question that leads her to confess her sin. You see, because what he knows is this, is that unconfessed sin causes us to hide. Unconfessed sin causes distance between us and our heavenly father. And so he doesn't, he doesn't confront us with our sin to, to shame us or to beat us over the head with it. He lovingly comes and he, he asks us to deal with the sin in our lives. Why? Because he wants relationship with us. He wants to remove the thing that's blocking. And, and, and so he comes to us and he says, hey, he asks us questions and, and he causes us to deal with, to be confronted by our, our own sinfulness. Not to shame us, but because he paid the price. He paid the price to get rid of that. And if we're still holding on to it, he's saying, hey, look, it's already been taken care of. The bill's already been paid. Get rid of that. Get rid of that so that our relationship can be complete. When we encounter God, his holiness, just to be in his presence causes us to face our sinfulness. Just to be in his presence causes us to have to face who we are and what we've done and to deal with it. But he does that not so he can punish us, so, but so that he can cleanse us. And, and then the woman, the woman turns this conversation to something that kind of confuses her. She, she turns it to, a, to, a, to talking. She, she goes from, you know, you would think like she's avoiding, you know, what he just brought up. But she takes a conversation to this place and asks a question about worship. You see, because when we encounter God, we are drawn to worship. And, and, and this is huge for us. When, when we encounter, when we come face to face with him, we are drawn into worship. She says, it says, she says our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans 
Worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declares, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now so often, so often we get stuck or sucked into secondary arguments about how things ought to happen. Um, we, we, make, we, we make a big deal about, you know, where we worship or how we worship. You know, the songs that we use, the, the music and all these things. And, and obviously we know that, that worship is so much more than just the, the music and the songs. Worship is, worship is recognizing who God is and responding to him and whatever response we give is an act of worship. I mean, at the heart, everything is about this, about worship and our relationship with him. I mean, we were made to worship God when we recognize God for who he is, when we reflect on what he's done for us. The only correct response is worship. When we recognize his majesty, when we really get in touch with who he is, all that he's created, just how amazing and powerful and awesome he is, we can't help but respond in praise. When we recognize his provision, all that he's given to us, then we can't help but respond by, by giving. When we, when we recognize his forgiveness, we respond by forgiving others. When we recognize everything that he wants to do on our behalf, we can't help but respond by serving him and serving others. So worship is recognizing and responding to him. And the answer is not where. The answer is not how. The answer is who. And Jesus says, look, the answer that you're looking for, the answer is not a where question. The answer is a who question. And Jesus says, and the who, the real answer, Jesus says is me. He says, don't worry so much about where. Don't worry so much about how. Focus on the who. And once we've encountered Jesus, our hearts are drawn to worship and we're compelled to share. When we encounter Jesus, we are compelled to share what happens to us. This woman, after this encounter with Jesus, um, it says, just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. Okay, so they're surprised too. They have expectations, those expectations are shattered. Um, but, one, but one asked, um, uh, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Okay, now, now hone in on this part. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. Now skip down to verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. We talked about being a witness last week. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days, and because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Now, I, I love the part at the beginning that says, she left her water jar. I always wonder, like I always try to hone in on little pieces of the story. She left her water jar and she ran to town. Now, there's some interesting pieces about that. Because number one, it tells us that she put aside what she came to get. She put aside her agenda she put aside what she thought she was going to come away with. She put aside, you know, what her task for the day was. And then she ran to town. Now, listen, the reality is 
is that she was at that well in the middle of the day, in the middle of the heat, because most everyone else went in the morning or later on in the afternoon. You know, she, she had some character issues. I mean, in a small town like this, she'd had five, five husbands and now she's living with some other guy and, you know, her life isn't exactly, you know, pristine, right? And so she's avoiding everybody else. But now all of a sudden, Jesus enters the scene. She has this interaction. She has this encounter with Jesus and she is compelled to run towards the people she's been avoiding, to go to everybody who just minutes before she would have expected to avoid her and she wanted to avoid, and now she's, she's going to all these people. She's saying, you've got to come see this. You've got to check this out. She leaves her jar. She leaves everything she came with behind. And this woman who just yesterday avoided everyone else is now rounding up the whole town to tell them about what Jesus has done. Here at Newberry Park First Christian Church, when we talk about encountering God, it is about inviting people into Jesus' presence. It's about helping them discover who Jesus is, what he's done for them. It's about helping people discover what the Samaritan village discovered and what they proclaimed is this, this man really is the savior of the world. And he wants to encounter you. When we encounter God, we worship. And we draw attention to God. We point people in his direction. And we invite people to set down their agendas, to set down all of their cares, all of their worries, all of their anxieties, everything else. And to say, we've got someone who can quench the thirst that your soul longs for. And to invite them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want you to know this morning that he wants to encounter you. Now each week we have one of the greatest opportunities to, to gather, to spend time with, to encounter God. And we, we, we call it communion. But this morning I want you to kind of picture it as, as coming to the well. Coming to a place where you are going to encounter Jesus, where you're going to encounter the one who gave his life for you. And, and, and so this morning what we've done is we, we've set up communion a little bit differently. Um, we've got some places, some tables up here, and there's some in the back. And so what we want you to do is, is take this time. Just take this time to encounter him. Maybe it's just to close your eyes for a minute and imagine that, that you're coming to the well. For some of you, it might be that he's going to, he's gonna shatter your expectations and tell you that all those things that you've been worrying about this week, that he's got something much more important for you. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's gonna be to recognize and and deal with some sin in your life. And maybe like the woman left the jar, you need to leave that. You need to leave that up here. But whatever you do is realize this, that he, he came and gave his life so that we could encounter him. And so we come and we respond in thankfulness and worship. And we humbly bow before him. So when you're ready... When you're ready, just spend some time. Let him speak to you. Let him overwhelm you with his presence. And then come and take the elements. If you wanna take them back to your seat, that's great. You can do whatever you want. If you wanna go sit somewhere else, that's great. If you wanna come and just kneel and pray, that's great. Don't come necessarily with expectations. Listen to him and ask him, what, what do I do, Father, to encounter you? And then realize that he has set this table before you so that we would remember what he's done for us. Recognize that he died for you to cleanse you of your sin 
so they could spend eternity with you and then respond accordingly. In 1 Corinthians 11, Jesus said that, or Paul said this, for I see from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will you remember what he did for you? Will you realize he's with you still? And will you respond and take this time to encounter him? If you need to know Jesus, if you need to give your heart to him, and I'll be sitting here, some of our elders will be up front or by the tables in the back, and we would love to talk to you more about how to truly begin this life of encountering him. Let's pray our Heavenly Father. Lord God, you are good. We love you, Father. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray, Lord. We pray that you will direct us to an encounter with you. Not just here, not just now, but each and every day. Let us know that you are with us. And Father, help us to realize it to recognize your presence and to respond to you. Pray this in Jesus' name.